Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, Mongolia, a country you hear almost nothing about, but with the focus sharpened for parliamentary elections, we're looking at Mongolia's resource-led boom and how to stop it from becoming a bust. Plus, a trip to Kilavoka, the biggest sailing regatta in the world, and how German software powerhouse SAP is combining business with pleasure. So just the two stories for you this week on Counting the Cost, but covered in full with feature interviews from the Mongolian president and the co-CEO of SAP. That second interview was part of my trip to Kiel earlier in the week, and we'll bring you all of that in the second half of this show. First, though, one of the world's fastest growing economies and one that looks like it'll only grow faster. And to be fair, Mongolia is probably not the first country you'd think of with that description. A vast country sandwiched between two global powers, of course, Russia and China, with economic growth of 17.3% in 2011 and projections of even higher in 2012. A big reason for that is its huge deposits of coal, copper and gold, an estimated $1.3 trillion in mineral wealth. And the government's not been afraid to use it either. Spending grew 56% in 2011 from the previous year. Here's the problem though. Is it all just too much too fast? Big growth, big spending. It inevitably sparks in high inflation. And Mongolia is no exception with 11% inflation in December. And there's the old danger of the resource curse. The idea and concern that too much of Mongolia's boom is coming from these rich deposits and that its biggest customer by far is China. So as China goes, so potentially does Mongolia. Now the hook here, as we mentioned, is that it is election time. And of course the economy is one of the big issues for voters. And it's a familiar story too, a country with lots of resources, but little of the reward trickling down to the nation's poorest. We've got a great report here from Steve Chow, who gives us a glimpse of life inside a rapidly changing country. For centuries, Mongolians sought out the freedom of the open plains. The grasslands offered the idyllic, slow-paced, nomadic life. But as is elsewhere, the traditional ways are breaking apart. And the lure of the city is pressing in on those like Serentuya's children. I would be happy if they stayed here to care for our livestock. That is nature. The air is fresher. But nowadays, I know they need professions and opportunities. Yet, of the more than a million that have moved to Mongolia's capital of Ulaanbaatar in recent years, their search for a better life has proved a struggle. The city is ringed by slums, where there is little running water and little sanitation. Roughly half of the people here can't find jobs. Even though there is very little in these shantytown communities in terms of basic needs, there is some promise for the future. The government is offering each and every Mongolian about a thousand shares in the country's largest coal mine. Mongolia's path out of poverty, says the government, is its vast riches under the surface. But a few shares say some are a fraction of what corrupt officials and the business elite are taking. The government admits the problem. All these things said, the only way out of the situation is to have more growth that is more just. And the only system that would be able to deliver it is what we have now. Besides taking steps to be more transparent, the government says it's also funneling mining profits into developing new fields of opportunity for Mongolia, like farming. Bayar Kudondo tried his hand at it but delays in getting a loan, along with bad weather, destroyed most of his crops and his trust. Bureaucracy is the main problem here. All the red tape takes too long. I've lost so much. Serentuya says she realizes she will have to let her children go, but she hopes they will return, saying while life is also poor here, it's better to struggle out on the plains where it's still home. Now, you heard towards the end of that report a complaint about bureaucracy and red tape. It goes further, too, because corruption has continued to dog the country. Transparency International ranked Mongolia 120th out of 183 on its latest corruption scale, the same level as Iran and Bangladesh. And the government's been accused of pursuing a politically motivated investigation against an ex-president. Steve Char put that to the current Mongolian president when he sat down with him a few days before the elections. Because corruption is so endemic here, people joke about the fact that at, some, at times parliamentarians might buy their seats. 
can you truly say that this investigation is independent and free of any influence, including yours? Uh, I think Mongolia is making progress uh, in a fight of corruption in this country. Uh, now this time we are taking unprecedented, you know, fight and uh, against corruption. And, I, and every uh, high officials coming from the Western countries, they actually emphasized corruption issue, issue in this country and urged us to have action. I think uh, I would like to urge uh, our allies, international community, follow this case very closely. And many people think that, aha, uh -huh, if there is former president, even in detention center, if there is former president's case, you know, a really corruption case uh, under investigation, I think there might be any other case can be investigated and our law applied equally to everyone, you know. There is nobody above the law. That, that gives great confidence to people, and we have to work for that. Speaking of confidence, Mongolia must be feeling pretty well right now. Last year, it posted the highest growth of GDP of any country, I believe, 17.3%. With that, of course, comes challenges for a growing country. Inflation was at 11.1%. The world's economic markets are still a roller coaster ride. How does Mongolia plan to deal with potential economic shocks? Can it deal with potential economic shocks? Most of our growth actually coming from mining, and we would like to make our economy like you know like a rainbow colored economy. You know now Mongolian economy has a mostly one color. We would like to add more more colors. Of course, I have a message to our foreign investors: Do not see Mongolia as a single, you know, mining uh, business country. You know, there are many opportunities. We have uh, roughly three million people, fifty million cattle. And we have a 1.5 million square kilometer land in this country. And Mongolia can be a great hub between Russia and China in this region, infrastructural hub, financial hub, high-tech hub, you know? We have that potential. But still a horrible infrastructure at the moment. The traffic jams outside of the government house here, I'm sure you see that every day. Pollution, infrastructure issues, crucial for us to encourage other industries to come here, you know, is good infrastructure. How soon are we gonna see this change? Will we see this change? You know, urbanization, living in a city is quite new thing for Mongolians. Actually, most of Mongolians dismounted from their horses just <laughs> maybe 50 years ago. And there, there was very different culture. And now we have to live in a harmony with our nomadic culture and also urban culture. I think we will address this issue in the coming four years. And of course, we will address issues related with infrastructure and issues related with the human development. Now people are asking very fair questions. If our economy growing in a very fast way, you know, we have a high economic growth, why I not feel that? One, one political party is suggesting to go so far as to take back Taban Tolgoy for the people. That's, that's what they're campaigning on, saying that if they are elected into parliament, they will give 100% shares to the ownership of the Mongolian people. What do you think about a, that approach, taking back from the foreign companies? You know, that's wrong. That's not in line with Mongolian national interest. I think there should be more third party investment in this country. We have to create favorable conditions for investments, local investments and foreign investments, investments from, from our two neighbors and from the third, third neighbor. That, that, I think that's the wrong direction to take. You know, we will take 100% this and we will change the agreement with the biggest investment ever we had with foreign investors. That's, that's wrong. I think we have to honor our agreement do you have anything in place to deal with world financial troubles like a sovereignty wealth fund? Do you have that parachute? Ten years ago, we thought, you know, sovereign wealth fund and those big funds, big financial institutions is the best, 
institutions you know, in the world, but they are failing. And now we have to be very cautious, you know, for everything. There is no perfect thing. If you could for me, can you paint the picture of what Mongolia will look like in a decade's time, two decades' time? People talk about double-digit growth in the economy for as far as perhaps you can see on the Mongolian plains. What will Mongolia look like? Will it look like South Korea? Will it look like another nation? I hope we will address in a 10 year from now, we will address today's problems properly, you know, and Mongolian people will live with their dreams, you know, will we'll live in a, in a better stage than today they, they are living. And in 10 years time, will the ex-president actually face his day in court? I really don't know, you know. I think uh, that, that thing should apply to anyone, even to ex-president. You have to go to the justice of court, not to the justice, not the court of the public opinion, not the uh, creating the, some side shows. That's, that's not good. If you are, you know, guilty, you have to be in a place where guilty people are there.